to our eighth CWIT conference. It's really a great pleasure uh, to be here to um, start the conference off. Um, this, this is the eighth, as I said. Uh, it's, it's been a dream and, and a vision for some of us uh, to see CWIT grow to what it is now, and I'm sure you're going to learn a lot about CWIT uh, uh, this morning and, and this afternoon. Uh, just, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great, great uh, thing to actually see how CWIT has grown over the past five years. Um, now, we deserve a lot of credit. After all, everyone in Silicon Valley is still asleep right now for us to be able to get up this early in the morning, right? Um, now, I love the subject of this conference. The daily headline tells us how desperately we need a smarter world. And uh, we've been at the university for many years trying to get people smarter, right? Technology by itself can't make people smarter, but information technology can give unprecedented numbers of people the tools to collect unprecedented amounts of information and to exercise unprecedented levels of control over our information. We can communicate our information anywhere in the world that helps us make smarter decisions and that makes our economies more productive. Here are some of the benchmarks. Almost a third of the world's population use the internet. More than two billion people. World internet usage has increased by almost 500% since 2000. Incredible numbers. Wireless penetration worldwide is even more impressive at 74%. The number of global mobile connections exceeds 5 billion. We all know that the great productivity gains of the 1990s and early in this century were driven by information technology. The IT investments of the preceding decades paid off big time. Now we're beginning to see the impact of the wireless revolution Intel conducted a study of its own workforce a few years ago and found two important things. The company measured a 5% increase in weekly productivity from upgrading to faster wireless technology for its workers. In addition to the quantitative increase, the company found that wireless mobility changed the way their employees worked, for example, they filled in time between face-to-face -face appointments, answering emails. Intel was one of the first companies to discover that connected employees work smarter. This conference will tell us a lot more about um, how workers are figuring out for themselves how wireless technologies can help them become more productive. The great thing about this conference is that it has brought together leading researchers at CWIT's uh, partners around the world. More than 150 organizations are represented here at this conference. Um, we have uh, representatives from the United States, Germany, India, and Korea to give us an exciting sneak preview of the information technology future. Some of the highlights of the conference, are very exciting, is a joint symposium on wireless medicine and health technologies with our sponsor, the Gary and Mary West Wireless Health Institute, which will run throughout the day. And I think, uh, is Joe around here yet, or is he still asleep? Joe? Joe. Hey! <laughs> so you're, you're on the New York time now, I guess. Um, the full-day tutorial that our sponsor, CIA Technologies, is holding on cloud computing, extremely exciting. That was the brainchild of our chair of our advisory board, Russ Arts. Russ, put your hand up, please. Thank you. <laughs> the security of the smart grid, which is one of the highest priorities in federal policy on the smart grid. 
new technologies for smarter data centers and smarter, safer mobile computing. These are some of the hottest topics in the information technology today. And I guarantee if you can get to all these sessions and hear the terrific speakers, you will be a lot smarter by the end of the day. Do you get that? Okay. They still have to take all the sessions first before they. But you have to get to all of these sessions. Now, please join me in thanking our wonderful sponsors who made today's program possible. Uh, CA Technologies and West Wireless Health Institute, which I've already mentioned. IBM, Motorola, Northrop Grumman, Verizon, Softion, the Omnicon Group, and Zvam International. And I'm sure I must have missed one or two others. We also want to thank the local organizations that are at the forefront of information technology, in particular, uh, ListNet, and we have the president of ListNet here, Peter Goldsmith. Thank you, Peter. Uh, the IEEE <clears throat> and the Long Island Forum for Technology, as well as uh, the Angel Network here on Long Island. Now, you will be even smarter by the end of the day if you take the time to visit their booths and the booths of our exhibitors, where there are <clears throat> demonstrations of some of the great new technologies that you will be hearing about during the day. I just want to add one, one thing about the context within which CWIT is at the university and why CWIT plays such a critical role in the economic development, not only if, uh, for our region, but I believe for the, for the nation. Um, <clears throat> CWIT is located in the research park, and I think a lot of you have seen it already. Right next to it is a facility that houses the Advanced Energy Center at Stony Brook. Uh, the Advanced Energy Center, a major part of its um, mission is focused on uh, the smart grid and, and smart, grid, uh, smart energy grid. And there's a lot of interactions between CWIT and the Energy Center. The third building that we will be putting up in that research park is focused on biomedical technologies. And uh, we are at CWIT again plays a major role as an enabler of a lot of the technologies that we are applying to the um, healthcare, healthcare technology. So if you look at CWIT, it really is cross-cutting. A lot of the major verticals in technology development, whether it's homeland security and defense, whether it's healthcare and technologies, CWIT or materials, CWIT plays a major role in enabling them. So we are very, very proud of the fact that we already have made a tremendous start by having CWIT as well as the Advanced Energy Center, and now we're going to the third, which is developing the um, biomedical technologies uh, facility that will house some of the R&D that is take, the research is taken out of the campus and is then we help commercialize it in these facilities. So it's a very exciting time for us. Let me now uh, introduce um, a colleague um, I will, who I mentioned before, which is uh, Russ Arts, who is the vice chairman of CA Technologies and also the co-founder of the uh, company. He has been uh, very important, played a major role in building up CWIT to the, and the organization of CWIT, and has taken a personal commitment in advancing CWIT. Now, his problem is that he did not graduate from Stony Brook. <laughs> so he's trying to make up for that, okay, by helping us a lot. But uh, seriously, uh, Russ, Russ is a wonderful, wonderful person. CA is right across the road, of course, from here. Um, from the hotel, uh, but uh, Russ has taken a major interest in CWIT and he is making the dream and the vision for CWIT happen. So please join me in welcoming Russ Arts. Thank you, Yaakov, and good morning. Uh, I can tell you very often I feel 
like I graduated from Stony Brook, as I'm surrounded by Stony Brook faculty and students uh, all the time. Uh, I'm going to speak briefly this morning uh, in this opening and talk about my industry, information technology, and how we're using CWIT at my company, CA Technologies, how we're using uh, CWIT to provide the innovation we feel we need to advance uh, our company and to help our customers. So we've been in business for over 30 years, 30, actually 35 years. As Yaakov said, I'm one of the founders. Uh, luckily, I started when I was very young. And, um, you know, if you think about it, we're all on a journey, you know, and the journey continues. You know, I saw it some years ago in the 90s, you know, when companies who were on the mainframe and using IBM mainframes, which is what I started with when I graduated from university, and uh, mainframe was it, you know, and we built our business around the mainframe. Very powerful computers, I think uh, the most reliable, the most performance-oriented computers even today uh, than anything out there. And CA, my company, uh, built a set of products that's enabled us to be the number two uh, software company in the world next to IBM who makes the mainframe, uh, you know, on the mainframe computers. But there was a journey. And the journey in the 90s was moving from mainframe, and it was a combination. Many of our customers never moved. Uh, in fact, many of our customers use more mainframe MIPS than ever. But there was a major movement and transformation from a mainframe environment into client server. You know, and that was in the early 90s, through the 90s. You saw uh, portable operating systems come out like Unix, uh, hundreds of variants of Unix. It started at Bell Labs you know, and, and blossomed from there. Sun had their Solaris system, HPUX. IBM had AIX, and it goes on and on and on. And we were there, and we were opportunistic enough in the 90s to create a product unicenter that certainly changed my company, Computer Associates at the time, uh, into a powerhouse technology company. Because what we did with Unicenter is we said, you know, here's an opportunity to take all the different operating systems out there. And there, as I said, there were hundreds of different variants of Unix. There was Windows. There was mainframe, and we provided a product that provided end-to-end -end management and simplified the management of these very complex data center environments. And that's gone on for the, for the, you know, from the early 90s till today. But today, the journey continues, and the journey is into cloud computing. And Yaakov mentioned that I started a cloud computing center of excellence at Stony Brook. We have that. Um, and it's an important center. But that journey into cloud is real. Companies are doing it. I'm seeing a lot of mid-sized companies moving to the cloud very quickly. Some of our traditional, very large enterprise customers are moving there at a slower pace, but they're moving there. And it presents a whole new model and a whole new set of opportunities, even bigger than the client-server opportunities that presented itself back in the early 90s. <clears throat> and that opportunity is where companies are looking, obviously, with the economy being what it is worldwide. You know, everyone's looking to be more productive, be more efficient, uh, to be more cost conscious. And what the cloud does, and what's so attractive to companies, is that the cloud really provides a new model of presenting software to end users. You know, for years, and I've dealt with many of, you know, all of our strategic customers at CA, and we've focused on the Fortune 1000 through the years, you know, everyone agrees that technology in the past has been too difficult. Very difficult to implement, very difficult to use, too hard. It shouldn't be that hard. You shouldn't have to be, you know, a detailed C++ or Java programmer to be able to get things done in technology. It should be simple, you know? And that's why companies like Apple and Google have done so well and have really gone to the top of the heap in technology innovation because they've innovated new solutions that provide a level of simplicity 
where I see my grandkids, I have a three-year-old who can navigate through an iPad and use an iPad very effectively. Why? It's that easy. You know, try using a mainframe. It's just not that easy. Try using Linux. You need to be technical. You know, so the whole model in the cloud is more than just, you know, you're processing in the cloud. You don't, you don't, you know, you're no longer tethered to, to where your application is running in the cloud. The whole concept is you don't care where it's running. It's running out there in the cloud somewhere, somewhere on the web. And companies like CA Technologies, my company, worry about the management worry about the reliability, worry about the security. You know, a lot, of, a lot of people, you know, were very concerned recently, you know, a lot of companies have gone to using Amazon, you know, and Amazon has provided a cloud infrastructure for companies. And recently they had some real quality issues, you know, and I hear, heard from customers, what do you think? You know, is the cloud really worth it? Is it reliable? You know, and the answer is yes, it's worth going to the cloud. Does it need reliability and security and management and, and some of the things we do and other companies provide? Yes, and that's the opportunity. And that's really a major opportunity for my company. So we've been helping our, our customers go on this journey from mainframe to client server into the cloud. And it's gonna be very much a hybrid environment. Nobody's gonna just say, forget everything I have today and just move to the cloud. You know, it's gonna be a gradual process where companies will have some of their applications running in the cloud, some of their applications will be running, you know, in their legacy environments, but everyone is looking for cost savings and everyone is looking to use this new model that you hear about called SaaS, software as a service, because in the future, our business is changing very, very quickly, you know, and the whole business model is changing. You know, for years we've sold our products, you know, as enterprise licenses, you know, and, you know, and you provide upfront money to buy our products and you then get to use it and you have maintenance, et cetera. The whole model is changing where companies now want to pay as they go. And really the cloud business model is all about providing software as a service. So you as an end user are receiving software services as you need them, when you need them. And you pay as you go. And the more you use, the more you pay. The less you use, the less you pay. You know, and that's the whole model around SaaS, and that's a major investment my company is making. You know, we focus on IT management of the largest networks in the world, but now we've also been focusing on the mid-market as well and working with partners and managed service providers all over the world, you know, and that's going to continue. And as we develop our products, we find that innovation is the key. You know, for us to remain competitive and for us to remain a leading software vendor, innovation is critical. It's critical for us. It's critical for all of you. And we found that working at CWIT has helped us in this innovation endeavor. So going back, you know, actually going back to the beginning of CWIT, my company, I'm proud to say, helped sponsor and went to New York State and went to Governor Pataki at the time to help, along with Symbol, to help get the money needed to build CWIT. So we're very, you know, very fortunate to have been able to help Yaakov and the folks at Stony Brook achieve that vision and dream that Yaakov spoke about. You know, and a couple of years ago, I was asked to become chairman of the advisory board of CWIT, which I did. And then just last winter, I brought our CEO, Bill McCracken, over to CWIT, and we spent a couple hours there. And we spoke about, we saw all the innovation, we saw Ari Kaufman's virtual reality center, you know, and uh, Bill, our CEO, immediately scheduled a virtual colonoscopy and, you know, and, you know, I mean, he was, he was quite taken by the technology. And what we decided to do after his meeting was to set up an innovation center at Seawood. And that's what I'm running. And that's what, you know, I'm building with some of the most senior people from CA, people like Vince Ray and John Kane and, and Bill McAllister, et cetera, are here. They're actually here today running the cloud computing um, symposium that's going to be going on most of today. And we decided that we know we need to innovate and we know we need to innovate 
quicker and more efficiently. And we saw CWIT as a way of doing innovation. And the model there is that we develop products, but we combine the experience and capabilities we have at CA. And as I said, we bring over some of our most experienced development and development leaders where they work at CWIT. We're fortunate enough where our headquarters in Islandia is only seven miles from Stony Brook. I know the route very well. And we combine that with using some of the world-class talent at CWIT, including the professors who are doing, you know, leading emerging technology research in areas like graphics, in areas like user interface, in areas like wireless and mobility, all very applicable to what we want to do. And we've hired over 30 students, graduate students from Stony Brook. And it's very interesting. And we hired them as CA employees through CWIT. And it's very interesting to see, you know, the students we hired are very, you know, come in as world-class students because they're more than students. Almost everyone, and I got involved in the interview process, almost everyone we hired are kids who graduated from top-notch universities, got their bachelor's or master's degree, are now doing graduate work at Stony Brook, but before they went to Stony Brook, they worked for three or four years in industry. And they worked at companies like Samsung and Citrix, and they developed commercial software just like my company does. So when we bring these students in, they come into CA not just as brand new you know, graduates of some university, but they come with three or four years of experience at software companies, at technology companies. And it's been very, very beneficial to the way we've been able to innovate. Um, and we are innovating like crazy, and you can take a look, just take a peek at what we're doing if you go over to, I was just over in the uh, demo room around the corner, you can take a look and see some of the projects that we have underway, and we're gonna be showing some of this new innovation at our big CA World Conference. We have a big conference every 18 months, and it happens to be coming up next weekend, and we're gonna be showing the innovation we've been doing here at Stony Brook we're going to be showing it at CA World, showing it to our customers. I actually sent a note out to some of our top customers, and they all want to meet with me. I mean, I don't know how I'm going to have the time to meet with everybody, but we're lining up one-on-ones like crazy because all of our customers and partners are interested in what is CA doing in terms of innovation, how are you doing it, and tell us about this model you're using at CWIT because it sounds like a very interesting model, and it is, and it's working very well. So, again, uh, thank you for coming this morning. Uh, that kind of gives you an introduction as to what we're doing in the industry and how we're using CWIT, and we intend to continue to expand the program, continue to work with the students, work with the faculty, and hopefully create more and more job opportunities for people here in New York. Thank you. Thank you very much, Russ. Um, it's very exciting. Um, next, I would like to introduce the um, uh, executive director, president, whatever. What, what title do you want? Remember, I'm the CEO. Janitor. Janitor, OK. <laughs> uh, Sachi, Dr. Satya Sharma, uh, who came to us from industry. He, um, Worked at Symbol for many years. Uh, worked at, uh, I think, TI, was it Texas Instruments? Or Bell, La well, Bell Labs you worked for. And then before that, he did something else. Uh, he's the only person I know that has three undergraduate degrees, two master's degrees, and a PhD. Um, he has worked in many, many different areas in industry. Uh, quality control, manufacturing, and then was also the head of the wireless division for Symbol Technologies for a long time, um, and then was in charge of worldwide operations for them. And then he came to, uh, to uh, Stony Brook and Seawit because he felt that it was very important to get some academic experience for, for him to really 
complete his you know, the circle of life and all that kind of good stuff. So uh, it's just, he's just a wonderful person, and he has taken the lead in uh, getting uh, the Seawit Center up and running, and I'm very, very proud uh, to say that he's my friend. Please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Satya Sharma. Well, thank, thanks, Yaakov. I thought you were going to say that I couldn't figure out where to end up. Yeah, well, OK. <laughs> uh, before we start, uh, let me cover some uh, housekeeping items for today's conference. We have a very rich conference. Uh, we have uh, more than 60 oral presentations and more than 72 uh, or 73 uh, poster papers. Uh, the location of the sessions, I think if you look at your program, uh, you, these are all color coded. So you can look at your session, look at the color, and then you can look at the rooms which are color coded the same way. So that's how you can find where the sessions are. Each speaker has 20 minutes, including Q&A. Please see session chairs in the session room before the session starts, hopefully 15 minutes before the session begins. Make sure that your PowerPoint is loaded into the computer in your session room. Audiovisual support is available in the room. For the poster papers, uh, the posters are numbered according to what they are in the, uh, in the uh, program. All poster presenters must be available to answer questions during breaks, as well as poster session, which is the formal from 5 to 7 p.m., 5.30 to 7 p.m. There will be two posters award, which will be judged by the uh, committee. And two poster awards will be announced, uh, excellent prizes, at 7 p.m and the poster presenters must be present to claim their prize. The session chairs should meet at the podium after the two keynote speeches this morning with the program chair. Uh, he will give you a program chair, will give you the ribbons which you can put on your badges so that you can be identified as the program chairs. The exhibits, I think, are spread all over the conference room. Uh, please visit them, some excellent things. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge a few people, Kathleen Farrell, Cindy Davis, Chrissy Leanne, and uh, University Communications in the, uh, helping the conference. I think uh, both Russ and Yaakov talked a little bit about CIVIT. I think this is a facility uh, which, uh, of course, does its own research here at Stony Brook. But we're also trying to create cooperative relationships worldwide, and I'm glad to see a lot of our partners here. We, in fact, have a uh, unit of CIVIT in Korea, uh, the president of CIVIT Korea, Dr. Chun Ho Kim, is present here. Chun Ho, where are you? Okay. Uh, last year, this conference was in Korea, uh, and we're trying to rotate it uh, worldwide. And if there are any questions, uh, I will be around, and you can talk to me. Uh, I want to say a few comments uh, about uh, the importance of this conference. But before I do that, let me tell you a little story. The wife says to his husband, you always carry my photo in your wallet. Why? The husband says, whenever there is a problem, no matter how impossible, I look at your picture and the problem disappears. Well, she smirks and replies, you see how miraculous and powerful I am for you. He calmly replies, yes. I see your picture and say to myself, 
what other problem can be greater than this problem? <laughs> so I'm a little nervous about the conference because you put work and you still don't know how it's going to turn out. But then I look at the picture of my wife in my wallet and I say, well, this is probably going to be okay. <laughs> I don't tell this story to my wife, especially you, Yaakov, otherwise I'll be in a lot of trouble. So welcome to this uh, eighth international conference. And as you see from the program, it's a very rich conference. We have close to uh, about 160, 170 different organizations represented at the conference. And as you all know, I think Jakob mentioned, wireless information technology has played a major role in creating economic wealth worldwide. Most jobs in the nation are not created, are created by startup, small, and medium scale companies. And what information technology has done is that it created a platform, an infrastructure so that anyone with ideas and some brain can create a solution that can be commercialized in any part of the globe. In the past, to start a company, you needed a lot of capital, a factory, a large skilled workforce before one could create that company. Never in the history of mankind have we ever witnessed a phenomena where anyone from a remote area of Africa, China, India, South America, or the good old USA has equal opportunity to create a thriving enterprise. In my view, this is the greatest gift of US to the world. The wireless and IT infrastructure has created a level playing field for everyone. And the implications of this are not just economic, but political as well. You tell me how a few students at Harvard seven years ago could create an enterprise called Facebook that has not only created economic wealth in billions of dollars, but has also caused democratic revolutions in Egypt and in Libya and in many other parts of the world. Without wireless and internet and Facebook and Google and few other organizations like that, there was no way to mobilize people towards a common cause. We are seeing that even in the Occupy Wall Street phenomena. We saw a thing in a few months ago in India along the same lines to fight the political corruption. So I firmly believe that we are at the beginning of IT revolution and are yet to realize its full economic potential and in creating a democratic way of life in the world. So we are also providing through IT, information technology, and wireless what we call as the soft leadership. And this leadership is critical in winning the hearts and minds of people. So it is not just economy, it is not just wealth, but it is also much more important than that. And I'm not going to give you these statistics about, I think Jakob mentioned that, it took about 75 years for telephone to reach over 50 million users, 38 years for radio, 17 years for television, 11 years for personal computer. But with the development of cyber infrastructures, it only took three years for the internet to reach more than 100 million users. There are close to about 5.8 billion phones in the world. The total population is 7 billion in the world. So almost everybody has access to wireless and information technology. In three days, Apple sold more than 4 million iPhone 4S. So these are some of the amazing statistics. IT is an enabling technologies. And I think Russ mentioned about the role the cloud computing is going to play as we move into these things. So my purpose of these remarks is to point out that IT revolution has not only 
started. IT revolution has not only created economic wealth now, but the revolution has only started, and it will continue to create unprecedented prosperity, and that is why it is important to have a conference like this that brings people from all over the world to share the latest emerging technologies and ideas and provide a fertile ground for innovation and collaboration. Our first speaker the, uh, for the conference, the keynote speaker, is Dr. Moshe Kam, and let me introduce him uh, for you. Moshe Kam is the president of IEEE, one of the most prestigious engineering organizations in the country and worldwide. At present, he is also the department head and Robert Quinn Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Drexel University, right next to my alma mater, Penn. He leads the Drexel Center for Excellence in Information Assurance Education and directs the Data Fusion Lab, a research lab founded 20 years ago to investigate radar target classification. Dr. Kahn's professional interests are in wireless communications, robotics and navigation, detection and estimation, and engineering education. His research has been supported by NSF, DARPA, ONR, CERDEC, Lockheed Martin, and GlaxoSmithKline. Dr. Kahn received his BSc degree from Tel Aviv University, his MS and PhD degrees from Drexel, all I hate to say in electrical engineering, Yaka, uh, I was going to say computer science, but uh, Dr. Kam is, uh, is, is well versed in all aspects of uh, uh, all aspects of electric uh, in communications and wireless. He's an IEEE fellow for contributions to the theory of decision fusion and distribution detection, and a recipient of IEEE Third Millennium Award. Please welcome Dr. Moshe Kam. Thank you for the generous uh, introduction and for having me at that conference. Uh, I was asked to uh, come to this conference by uh, Dr. Shmuel Enav a couple of months ago on account of the fact that he heard that IEEE is doing interesting things in life sciences. Now, my assumption is that most of you know us. We are a well-known organization. We have been around for 127 years. Um, we have approximately 420,000 members by now. And most of our activities, if you try to look at them at a very um, broad brush, are in the areas of communication, computing, and power and energy. Life sciences, though we have been engaged uh, in this field for a long time are a new uh, major area for us uh, organizationally. And I want to tell you a little bit why we are uh, interested in uh, expanding into it and what we are doing in order to become uh, a, a major player in this field, which to some extent uh, we already are. So I'll give you the motivation of IEEE uh, in expanding its activities uh, into life sciences. I'd like to provide an overview of what is being done in IEEE in the areas of life sciences, including healthcare, with the hope that this will be useful to attendees uh, of this conference, and to make a few comments about trends and expectations. So, uh, not that we really need a definition, I think, in this, in this context, but let's just make sure that we know what we are talking about. In this context, we are talking about industry, that uses modern technology with a goal of improving human and animal health, addressing threats to the environment, improving crop production, uh, contain emerging and existing diseases, and improve currently used manufacturing technologies in this context. And there is strong evidence, and I'll show you some of this evidence, that the life sciences industry is growing. And Given the, the fact that we have been uh, a major player in the great expansion of communication, telecommunications in the last two decades, it is interesting to note 
that the life sciences in the context of what we are talking about, in, in the technical and scientific context, is actually expanding larger, uh, faster than, uh, than, communication, uh, than the communication sector did. And uh, we would place it someplace in, in this very, very general categorization um, attempt, someplace between the communication sector on one hand and the energy sector on the other. We believe that the life sciences industry, we know that the life science industry it will be a major economic player during to, during, due to its role in healthcare and improving the quality of life of aging populations. And of course, it goes without saying, and this is why IEEE is there, that there are intellectual challenges that are very interesting, in fact, quite exciting in the science, in the engineering, in the technology, and this is what always has motivated us. We are following, uh, following our interest. So just to put this thing um, maybe uh, in, in the context of a certain example, let us think about uh, drug discovery, a process that starts with, uh, with a, a process that is, uh, that is essentially pre-discovery, looking at the disease, trying to understand the disease, to pre-clinical work, to clinical trials, to, to review, in the, if, if we are uh, talking about uh, the largest organization that does this, the FDA, and eventually at the end to the large-scale manufacturing. And the reason that I show you this diagram is because of the fact that it starts with five to 10,000 compounds and it ends with one. So this is a process that um, is very costly in the sense that uh, you are trying very many candidates before uh, you end up with the one that may be successful. And in fact, it is interesting that in spite of the fact that we continue to struggle with several uh, very, um, very difficult diseases to conquer, the, l the number of new drugs that have been discovered in the last couple of years is actually on the decline. Now, where do we come in? Uh, I'm not going to go over the whole process one uh, step by step, and these slides will be available to you, uh, but we are going from the area of pre-discovery to target identification, to target validation, uh, to early safety tests, to lead optimization, preclinical testing, clinical trials, review and manufacturing, and we have a lot to do, which in the past was mostly done by others, but increasingly there is a recognition that engineering and scientists have a lot to offer in 